This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. In the early 1930s, two amateur prospectors in Wyoming chanced upon a baffling curiosity, the mummified remains of a tiny ancient human being. X-rays revealed what appeared to be a fully developed skeleton just 17 inches tall, about the height of a coffee table. Could the artifact be evidence that a mythological race of supernatural beings known as the Little People actually existed? In Mississippi, the tragic death of 18-year-old Andre Jones, the son of civil rights activists, is surrounded by a storm of controversy. In 1992, Jones was arrested at a routine sobriety checkpoint, but less than 36 hours later, he was dead. Authorities say he hung himself with a shoelace in the shower stall of his jail cell. Andre's parents say he was murdered. October 2nd, 1961, when 11-year-old Alan Betcher told his parents that someone had left a baby in their car, they thought he was joking. Today, that baby is a grown woman searching for her birth mother. Also tonight, in a remarkable update, a landlord watching Unsolved Mysteries is shocked to discover that one of his former tenants is wanted for murder. Join me. Perhaps you, too, may be able to help solve a mystery. The American West, a magical land with a rich and colorful past. For many, the frontier conjures up images of outlaws, cowboys, and buried treasure. But for Native Americans, this is ancient ground, steeped in a history which defies conventional beliefs and logic. For generations, medicine men of the Crow, Shoshone, and Arapaho tribes have told stories of a mythic race of supernatural beings able to perform feats of amazing physical strength. Incredibly, according to legend, these people stood less than two feet high. For more than a century, the story of the little people was just the kind of tall tale that the pioneers scoffed at. But all of that would change in 1932, when two men went prospecting in Wyoming. Hey. Cecil Maine and Frank Carr were two amateur hey. gold prospectors. Okay. And they were in the Pedro Mountains, which is right along the shore of Pathfinder Reservoir, about the center of the state. At the back of the cave, Cecil Maine and Frank Carr made an extraordinary discovery. What's that? What? Right here. Perched on a rocky ledge was a small figure, just six inches high, mummified in a sitting position. Some burial cave or something. We'd never seen anything like that before and would have no idea what it was, except that they knew it was probably worth taking out. Several days later, Cecil Maine returned to the cave alone. Paying no heed to the notion that the cave was a sacred Indian burial site, Maine snatched the mysterious mummy. It has been an object of great controversy and mystery ever since. Over the years, the mummy has come into the possession of a number of different people. Unsubstantiated rumor has it that each of the owners died under unusual circumstances. 
As far as anyone knows, the most recent owner disappeared without a trace nearly 20 years ago, along with the mummy. Those who believe in the legend of the little people claim a curse is responsible. Others maintain it's all just a coincidence. The discovery of the mummy in 1932 made headlines throughout Wyoming and prompted speculation that it had been placed in the cave by one of the Native American tribes. Many Native American spiritual people have told me that they have certain ways they bury and intern their dead. And uh, this, this mummy is in a different position than anything they've ever seen. Um, so they don't know exactly from their own viewpoints, they don't know what it is. However, Cecil Maine did not really care what the mummy was. He was looking to sell it, and eventually he found a willing buyer. In 1934, an insurance salesman named Homer Sherrill bought the mummy for $25 and took it on the road. One of the first people to hand over the price of admission was a curious 10-year-old boy named Eugene Bashor. You want to believe in mummies? Of course, you'll see it. You will have a great mummy tour. My dad didn't want me to see it. Uh, what I remember most about that was what a hard time I had talking him into giving me 25 cents so I could see the mummy. And when I went in, he went in one door and then walked past a table where the mummy was sitting. There was a guard there, and then out another door, and they moved you right by. You didn't get to look at it very long. It was about uh, six and a half inches high seated, and standing it would have been about 17 inches high. The mummy had brown skin and a flattened skull, with wisps of gray hair protruding from the back of the head. Although the mummy was seen by hundreds of people over the next 10 years, no serious scientific analysis was undertaken until 1950. Mr. Goodman? Ivan Goodman. By then, the mummy had fallen into the hands of a used car dealer named Ivan Goodman. Well, what do you have to show me? Goodman took the relic to Dr. Paul Martin at the Chicago Museum of Natural History for an analysis. Some serious efforts were made in the early 1950s to get this uh, uh, little mummy documented, and it was done rather well, I think, for the times. Um, there were uh, photographs taken, good photographs, that we can still look at. There were uh, x-rays taken. Uh, really a surprising amount of very uh, effective documentation was made. The x-rays revealed that the object had a complete skeletal structure, as well as a full set of teeth. Initially, it did appear to be the mummified remains of a fully developed human being, which happened to be 17 inches tall. But after reviewing all of the material, Dr. Martin reached an altogether different conclusion. In his opinion, the mummy was not a mature adult, but an infant who had suffered from a medical abnormality known as anencephaly. This is a condition in which infants are born without a brain and lack a complete skull. As a result, they may often take on the physical appearance of an adult. However, Eugene Bashor claims that other experts believe the malformed skull could have been the result of a severe blow to the head. Some of the people I've interviewed that were experts, doctors, radiologists, said there are pieces of skull in the scalp that's hanging down like it was beat down and it's a result of trauma, injury. Eugene Bashor further states that the scientists he spoke with believe the mummy had other adult characteristics. It also has a full set of teeth, quite prominent teeth, and uh, infants would show two sets of undeveloped teeth still up in the jaws. These have descended and there's no other teeth above them, like a baby or a young person would have. Dr. George Gill still disagrees. Yeah, all the physicians and physical anthropologists that I know of who have ever looked at, that I've been able to verify, to, to actually talk to them, um, have said that it's some type of infant and, and it looks to them to be an anencephalic human infant. Oh, I certainly am going to do everything I can to prove that. 
In October of 1950, Ivan Goodman loaned the find to Dr. Leonard Wadler, curator of a New York museum. Yeah, I like the sound of that. I'm going to trust him with you, Doc. You take good care of him. Oh, don't worry. He's in good hands. You take care, sir. I shall. Goodman felt there was a fortune to be made if Wadler could prove that the mummy was a North American relative of the pygmies, a race of people in Africa and Asia who stand four to five feet in height. Unfortunately, Ivan Goodman died of a sudden stroke before the theory was proven, and Wadler kept the mummy. What was the mysterious artifact uncovered in the remote mountains of Wyoming more than 60 years ago? Was it proof of the existence of a mythological race known as the Little People? Or was it the tragedy of an anencephalic infant born in primitive times? So much more could be done today in the way of analysis on this small mummy. Um, DNA analysis could be done. We have methods now that uh, could uh, allow uh, dating to be done without uh, being that destructive. So it's really important that the scientific community take another look at it. Uh, the controversy exists, it continues. It could be settled if we had the mummy. At this point in time, we don't know, and that's the mystery. Dr. Leonard Wadler was last known to be living in Florida. However, no one has seen the doctor or the mummy since 1975. While a scientific community would like to find the mummy for analysis, Native Americans hope the relic will be recovered for its spiritual value. In their view, a sacred burial site was disturbed, and ultimately, they would like to return the artifact to an appropriate resting place. Next, a series of mysterious hanging deaths in jails across Mississippi sparks a federal investigation. Tonight, there is a scandal brewing in Mississippi, a scandal which has prompted Attorney General Janet Reno to order an investigation by the Justice Department. Over the past five years, no fewer than 48 inmates of Mississippi jails, half of them black, half of them white, have died under mysterious circumstances. Every single death was a hanging. Every single death was ruled a suicide. This is a story of one Mississippi hanging. In the summer of 1992, Andre Jones was 18 years old, about to start his freshman year of college. His mother, Esther, was president of the Jackson, Mississippi branch of the NAACP. His stepfather, Charles X. Quinn, a nation of Islam minister. 1 a.m., Saturday, August 22nd, Brandon, Mississippi. Andre Jones and his girlfriend, Tanisha Love, were stopped at a routine sobriety checkpoint. Andre was driving a friend's pickup truck. Driver's license, please, sir. I don't have it. 1.30 a.m., Jackson, Mississippi, 20 miles from Brandon. Andre's parents were awakened when the phone rang. Hello? Hello, Mr. Quinn. This is Tanisha. I'm sorry to call you, but Andre's been arrested. Arrested? Andre's been arrested. Arrested? For what? For what? Yeah, Mom. It's me. 2 a.m. Andre called his parents from the Brandon police station. He said he did not know what he had been charged with. 4 a.m., Andre telephoned again, this time to say he had been transferred to the Simpson County Jail, 40 miles south of Jackson. According to his parents, he still did not know what the charges against him were. We were told that, that they could not tell us anything at that time. And Simpson County just refused to, to even talk to us. And they told us that we could not come to that jail. Have you heard anything? The Quinns say that they spoke exactly. with Andre at least five different times on Saturday. How can they keep me in here an extra day and they haven't even charged me? He was very much concerned about his charges. And we could I'm not fine. tell him anything. He was very much concerned about getting out immediately and, and so that he could attend school the very next day. About midnight that night, a, I heard a knock on the door. It was a Jackson police officer. Jackson Police Department. Okay. I have a message here from Mrs. Esther Jones Quinn. 
My husband, I can take it. Sir, I really need to deliver this to her in person. Charles, what is it? This officer has a message for you. Esther Jones Quinn? Yes. He gave me the piece of paper which only had a phone number for the Simpson County Jail. I'm really not sure, ma'am. There was not a note, there was not a message, it was only a number. Yes, hello? Yes, my name is Esther Jones Quinn. Y yes. I was informed that Andre had committed suicide, that I was casually informed that he had committed suicide, as if they could have been talking to someone that didn't even know who he was. According to Andre's parents, he had never shown suicidal tendencies. He had never even suffered from depression. Andre had no previous arrest record. So when Esther and Charles Quinn started to look into his death, they naturally began with the circumstances of his arrest. Andre and Tanisha had stopped by the Quinn's house in Jackson around 11.45 Friday night. They left and drove east toward Brandon, where Tanisha lived. Near the Brandon city limits, they came upon the checkpoint. According to the Quinn's lawyers, the police say that Andre Jones stopped just short of the checkpoint. They say Andre tossed an object out of the window of the truck. Sir, did you show something out of this vehicle? No, officer. Let me see your driver's license. Police identify the object as a 38 caliber handgun. Is that an open beer can? Inside the truck, they say there was an open can of beer. And finally, the truck, which Andre had borrowed and driven for more than a week, turned out to be stolen. Put your hands on the roof, spread your legs. I'm not sure if he knew or not if the truck was stolen. It would appear to me that if he knew the truck was stolen, he would be skeptical in driving it so openly. I didn't know nothing about the truck. But I knew there was no beer in the truck, and he did not throw a gun out the truck, because there was no gun in the truck. Tanisha Love's version of the events is very different from the reported police version. May I see your license, please, sir? I don't have it. You don't have a license with you? No, I forgot it. What's your name? Andre Jones. Tanisha claims that as soon as the officers heard Andre's name, their attitude immediately changed. Thank you, sir. After they asked him his name, they all went to a little... I say like a little huddle, you know, like football huddle. And they was, I don't know what they was talking about because they was talking low. And after that, that's when they came to the truck and asked Andre again, did he have his license? He said, no, sir, I don't have my license. Step away. Hands on the roof of the vehicle. And they asked him to step out the truck. And that's when they handcuffed him. They shackled his feet and they had him handcuffed at the same time. I didn't understand what was going on. State Public Safety Commissioner Jim Ingram believes Andre Jones was not shackled. In fact, Ingram disagrees with Tanisha's entire account. There was no confrontation whatsoever with uh, young Andre Jones. In fact, the officers were uh, very amazed how cooperative he was. This is two for one. According to Commissioner Ingram, Andre was so cooperative at the Brandon Police Department that he admitted being in a gang and even showed the police gang hand signals, which they photographed. He posed for photographs with different sign signals indicating how uh, gangs make statements by signs. It was uh, a very cooperative attitude on both sides. The, the officers have indicated they really uh, were impressed with this young man. Pine Child was very independent and a very um, intelligent young man with strong aspirations. And he had no need or, or no desire to become involved within the gang. Despite repeated requests, copies of the alleged photos of Andre illustrating gang signals have not been made available to Unsolved Mysteries or to Andre's family. Andre was charged on four counts driving a truck whose vehicle identification number had been altered, carrying a concealed weapon, possession of stolen license plate tags, and driving with an open container of alcohol. Commissioner Ingram remains adamant that the arrest was non-confrontational. Charles Quinn, however, says that an inmate in Brandon claims the police used racial epithets to intimidate Andre. One of the inmates who were transferred with Andre said that the officer 
said, do you know what happened to niggas for stealing a white man's truck? And of course, other statements were said to put fear in Andre. At approximately 4 a.m. on Saturday, Andre was transferred from Brandon to the Simpson County Jail 35 miles away. The Simpson County facility had a reputation as a dangerous jail. This is a rough diagram of the cell into which Andre Jones was transferred. Twelve other inmates were being held in the narrow L-shaped space. A dimly lit corridor next to the cell led to a toilet and the shower stall where Andre's body was found. One of the inmates uh, came forward and said, hey, this guy sure been in the shower for a long time. Uh, one of the men walked back and uh, said they found uh, a young man hanging by a shoelace and the shower still running. And that's when they called for the guards and immediately they unlocked the cell and took him down. Authorities state that Andre Jones had hung himself with his own shoelace. They say Andre tied the shoelace to an iron grate above the shower head. When Charles Quinn was allowed to visit the cell, he estimated the grate was approximately eight feet above the floor. He would need someone to have held him up to do that. And he would have needed some type of uh, stool to stand on. That's incorrect. The uh, point of attachment of the... Dr. Stephen Hayne, the state-approved pathologist who performed the autopsy, the said investigators had demonstrated that it was possible for Andre to have hung himself unaided. That position was easily reached by a uh, uh, member of the sheriff's office uh, who was acting as the decedent. Andre's parents also feel it is impossible that their son's body weight could have been supported simply by a lease from his running shoes. But Dr. Haynes says the laces were tested by the manufacturer and their tensile strength was found sufficient. Less than a week after Andre's death, his parents hired an independent pathologist, Dr. James Bryant, to examine the remains and review the case. I think it's uh, highly probable that he was strangled. Someone did this to him. In the usual case of a suicide by, uh, by hanging, the, uh, the ligature mark is uh, along the side of the neck and doesn't go all the way around. It's in this fashion. Whereas in the case of Andre Jones, the, uh, the ligature marking went along the side of the neck and all the way into the back and, and crisscrossed in this fashion. Uh, this suggests to me that, that, uh, that, that, there was, that someone had to come from behind and, and uh, wrap the ligature around his neck. And then furthermore, there's, there's no knot mark. The knot imprint area would be in the hairline and the hairline would act as a buffer, uh, no longer allowing for that imprint to be uh, present on the upper back surface of the neck. No, uh, Andre Jones' hair was cut short, and the, the crisscross marking was not in the hairline. And there were no knot marks anywhere else. Dr. Haynes' autopsy report listed no evidence of bruising on Andre's neck or anywhere else on his body. Dr. Bryant's observations were different. He had some bruising under one of his eyes, and also he had some bruising on the shoulder of the same side. The bruising could have been right at the time that, that he died, or it could have been sometime during the day. But, but, but apparently he, was, had, he suffered some kind of blunt trauma sometime during the, during the time he was in the jail. We were informed by one of the inmates that Andre was taken off that cell block and out of that jail. And when he was brought back in, he was brought back in in a wheelchair. And that he was laid on the shower floor and the hanging uh, scene was staged. My uh, uh, findings, based upon the uh, evidence uh, both at the scene as well as from the post-mortem examination, has been reviewed by many other authorities, including the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, the Department of Justice, the U.S. Attorney's uh, Office, as well as the Federal Bureau of Investigation, and by the Attorney General's Office of the State of Mississippi. And they are in concurrence with the findings that I made. 
then there was really no indication. In March of 1993, a coalition of civil rights groups conducted hearings in Jackson, Mississippi. Both eyes was black, the right side of his eyelid. Those testifying included the families of both black and white jail inmates who had died under questionable circumstances. And I have to sit and hold my four-year-old daughter. After two days of testimony, the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights recommended that the Justice Department open an investigation. I have to go through that. Five months later, Dr. Emily Ward, a specialist in forensic pathology, was named Mississippi State Medical Examiner. Dr. Ward went over the autopsy report of Andre Jones, as well as the autopsies of several other men who have died by hanging in Mississippi jails. I think that it's extremely unlikely that any of these deaths are anything other than suicide. All of the deaths have been investigated by not just one agency, but one or two, or sometimes three. And I think that although sometimes there may be questions that need to be answered related to the death, I don't think that it in any way affects whether or not the death is suicide or homicide. I would never believe that Andre committed suicide. I know my son was murdered. And the fact that his life was taken so cruelly and so abruptly makes me even more determined to see that he is vindicated. When we return, a man wanted for the murder of his girlfriend is captured thanks to an alert viewer. In July of 1986, 22-year-old Paula Paziak and her boyfriend Jerry Gervasoni arrived in Kissimmee, Florida from New Jersey to visit Paula's mother. I am so glad that you're here. They stayed there about one week. No, I don't. Come on, let's get the bag. Paula was as happy as a lark. The two of them were. I mean, they were very together. They were, they were just happy-go-lucky. So, do you guys have any plans for tomorrow, or what? Um, well, Paula and Jerry had arrived on a Wednesday. My relatives down in Miami. On Sunday night, they said their goodbyes. They told Barbara they would be leaving early the next day to visit another part of Florida. Well, we're getting uh, kind of tired. Well, I so. got up the next morning. Oh, OK, sweetie. Good, Good night. night. And I thought I heard them up. And I didn't know whether they were or not, so I didn't bother to say goodbye. Maybe if I had. Well, things would have been different. In the days that followed, an odd smell would intermittently waft through Barbara's home. She searched everywhere looking for its source, finally checking her own bedroom. <gasps> Hidden under the bed, wrapped in a bamboo curtain, was her daughter's body. Paula Pasiak had been strangled to death and left under the bed for nearly a week. The prime suspect was Jerry Gervasoni, but he had dropped from sight. He successfully eluded authorities for more than seven years until the night of our broadcast. Update, British Columbia, Canada. On October 21st, 1993, Jerry Gervasoni was arrested in the small community of Salt Springs Island, where he had been living under the assumed name Gordon McIntyre. When our program aired in Canada, Gervasoni's former landlord recognized him and immediately called authorities. I come home and uh, sit down to dinner about 9.30, quarter to 10, and uh, flip on the TV, and there was this black and white photo of Gordon McIntyre, my tenant. 
Once in custody, the suspect vehemently insisted that he truly was Gordon McIntyre, but fingerprints soon confirmed that he was, in fact, Gerald Gervasoni. At the local airport, Gervasoni tried to avoid photographers as he was hustled onto a waiting airplane. He was then flown to a deportation hearing in Victoria, Canada. Gervasoni will be held there pending extradition to Florida, where he will face charges in the murder of Paula Pasiak. On the evening of October 2nd, 1961, Mr. and Mrs. Earl Betcher and their youngest son, Alan, were leaving Baptist Hospital in Jacksonville, Florida. The Betchers had been visiting one of their other sons and could never have imagined the surprise that awaited them. Yeah, but I think it'll get better as it is. Mom, Mom, there's a baby in the back of our car. Alan, Alan that's not very funny. No, Mom, I'm, I'm serious. There's a baby in the car. Come oh. on. Oh. I believe so. I don't. The Betchers had found a healthy baby girl, no more than 72 hours old and weighing eight and a half pounds. Local papers dubbed the foundling Baby Girl X. She lived in foster homes for five and a half months before she was adopted by Mary Lou and William Christie of Tallahassee. The Christies named their new daughter Terrace, Terry for short. Terry grew up happily doted upon by her parents and her older brother and sister. Terry always knew she was adopted, but not until she was a teenager did she begin to ask the difficult questions. Who was her birth mother? Why had she given her up? I kind of rebelled and wanted to know. And that's when we went to the library and looked it up, and then I got excited. I was proud, you know. When she pressured me about her parents, I uh, had the big, the big problem about whether to tell her the truth as I knew it or whether to say I didn't know anything. And I really wrestled with it. And then I came out with uh, that I'd be safe to be truthful. Do you think that's it? I think you're right. Look. At the local library, Terry and Mary Lou tracked down all the newspaper articles about Baby Girl X. Terry was surprised to learn that she had been left in the back seat of a car. Nevertheless, she trusted her birth mother had her best interests at heart. She might have been a 15, 16-year-old little scared girl that had a baby and ran away from home. Look, look, there's the picture. I believe she had a heart. She put me somewhere safe where I was going to be well taken care of, and I appreciate that. She was probably watching them when the little boy came and found me in the car. She was probably standing there watching it. Did you, did you see anybody around? It no. bothers me not knowing exactly what day I was born, the time, you know, where I was born. I don't even know if I was born in a hospital, a midwife, uh, in the car, you know, I have no idea. I just, I would like to find that out. Today, Terry is 32 years old, the mother of a young son and daughter. She wants her children to have a heritage, to know their roots. They're all down in there. I would like to find a beginning. I just want to meet her and see how she is. I don't know, I'm getting older and I look at my kids and see how they're growing and I look in the mirror every day and I wonder. Thanks to our broadcast, Terry Christie Derby now knows the answers to all of her questions. Sadly, Terry's birth mother, Edith Campbell, died on August 17th, 1993, just a few months before our segment aired. But out of this sadness, a happy ending did emerge. 
Terry was delighted to learn that she had a sister and three brothers. They were delighted as well. None of them had ever known that Terry existed. On July 8, 1994, Terry went to a hotel in Miami, Florida to meet three of her siblings, Philip, Paul, and Cecilia, face to face for the first time. It was the neatest experience of my life. I walked in and there was everybody I wanted to see. Next to me giving birth to my own kids, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. Best thing. My, my experience is that there's more of a, just a biological thing in a family. There's also a, a karmic, um, a sense of underlying uh, destiny that lies underneath the whole thing. And this, you know, you meet somebody, I meet Terry, and it's like, she is my sister. I knew it right away, you know? There's no doubt. At the reunion, Terry and her adoptive mother finally saw a picture of Terry's biological mother, Edith Campbell. According to a family member, Edith had given Terry up only because of extreme financial desperation. Knowing what a what a loving person she was. Uh, she cared about nothing but her children her whole life. And um, I can only imagine the anguish that, that she went through uh, when she decided to do this. They make me feel wanted. They make me feel like I'm not an outcast, like I kind of felt like I was you know, in the past. But I, I, I can feel their um, Vibes, love, whatever, you know. It's kind of cool. Come on, let's go. Let's go. Come on. The next day, Terry met her other brother, Chris, who had been called out of town on business on the day of the reunion. That's right. Snuggle up, brothers and sister. At last, the family circle is complete. In the fall of 1993, the entire country was touched when 12-year-old Polly Class was abducted from her home in Northern California and savagely murdered. Thousands of copies of this composite sketch were distributed by police. In the end, its stunning accuracy helped confirm the identity of the prime suspect, Richard Allen Davis. Davis is now in jail, charged with the kidnap and murder of Polly Class. Law enforcement's secret weapon in the class case was this woman, suspect graphic artist Jeannie Boylan. These days, the FBI and numerous local jurisdictions compete for her time. Jeannie Boylan has come a long way from her first job in law enforcement. In the mid-1970s, Jeannie worked at the Sheriff's Department in Multnomah County, Oregon. The job gave her a close-up look at how suspect sketches were made. In many cases, Jeannie didn't like what she saw. He has more like that. More like that. Yeah. Maybe like that. No, -uh. more like no. that one. I would hear the way that investigators would question witnesses or victims, and I could, I could hear that they weren't allowing them to answer. They would cut the answers off. It was kind of just the facts, and uh, I, that, that seemed to me to be wrong. And then I would see the drawings that would be produced either through an identikit or through an artist. And I knew that they weren't right. There was something in terms of, something in terms of the heart, really, that was sort of missing in those pictures. Would you put any other shape around the eyes? Jeannie was convinced that she could do better. And in 1980, she got her chance. A supervisor gave Jeannie one of his most difficult cases, an unsolved rape that had languished for months with virtually no leads. I can't remember anymore. It's OK. I tr was trying a lot of different interview techniques, and, and I found that if I used a, sort of a diversionary system of interviewing, where we would kind of circumvent the, uh, the events of the crime and the scenario of the crime and talk about other topics, and I could relax them, then periodically this information would surface. You know, I just remembered something. He had a scar, and it started on his forehead, and it led back into his hair. It's like the tip of the tongue syndrome, where you have somebody's name that's right there, and you're trying to remember it. You can't bring it up, and maybe two or three hours later, you stop trying, and it just pops into your mind. 
I just remembered something else, too. Um, he had a white face. I knew that the drawing that had been done on that case prior to the one that I was doing was, was wrong. So what we came up with was so radically different that that was sort of fresh hope for that case. Jeannie was right. As a direct result of her composite, the suspect was arrested and later convicted. More cases followed, and Jeannie's reputation grew. I've seen a lot of the work Gene Boylan has done and very impressed. It's the best artist conceptions I've ever seen. And uh, if there, we ever have a chance of catching the person we're looking for through an artist conception, I think Gene Boylan is going to give us that chance. Most recently, the FBI turned to Jeannie Boylan in the troubling case of 16-year-old Jonathan Francia of Albuquerque, New Mexico. On January 12, 1994, Jonathan was in his car behind this restaurant in Albuquerque when two strangers abducted him. Five days later, a body believed to be Jonathan's was found, charred almost beyond recognition in the trunk of his burned out car. One of the killers, known only as Jason, is still at large. Investigators asked Jeannie to meet with a key witness, Scott Johnson. Hi. Yeah, I'm Gene Boylan. Scott, yeah, right. Nice to meet you. He had innocently spent several hours with the killers at his home in a Winslow, Arizona trailer park. This is a simple process. I don't want you to worry about it all. The Jeannie time. instinctively began to assess Scott's potential as an eyewitness. Scott is, uh, he's a very interesting man. Um, visual things are very important to him, you can tell, in the way that he dresses and he combs his hair. And, you know, he takes, he takes some care in the way that he looks, which was the first cue to me that I would be able to work in a visual context with him. So one thing that I did was I got out some Play-Doh, something to anchor him in the present and gave it to him for him to actually work on or to, to play with and sort of feel to keep him in the moment. I'll shave it more in the longer. As Scott told his story, Jeannie began to sketch the fugitive killer named Jason. Scott had met Jason on January 13, 1994. That day, a friend of Scott's named Trina Richardson was staying at the trailer along with her three children. They were awaiting the arrival of Trina's husband, Paul, who had gone to Alabama. He pulled in at around 6 a.m., accompanied by a stranger. What's happening? Not much. This is Jason. Hi. Come in. My first impression of Jason was, oh boy, this guy dresses like a cowboy. You know, the long, slender, kind of attracted. The girls so, would be attracted to him. Station, um, he had the the velvet hat, the long hair, and the jacket, and the you know the jeans, and kind of like worn out tennis. Scott noticed something else about Jason, something he would not truly understand until much later. I looked down and I noticed his hand was kind of like red, kind of clay type. I thought it was just, you know, dirt, but apparently it was blood. Soon after he arrived, Jason took a shower, the only time Scott saw him without a hat. Ash tree. Tell me a little bit about how you would put the placement of the hair. I'll place the hair kind of like long and back like over the ears. The I had no idea that anything was you know, wrong, like any crime has been committed. Um, I was just going along, just like my everyday, you know, normal routine, and they were too. Sounds like a really good deal. Where... Scott told Jeannie that he and Trina were out to run errands around 9 a.m., leaving Paul and Jason at the trailer. We came back, pulled up, and that's when they were washing the car. So as we pulled up, they saw us, and they shut the trunk. And they acted like they didn't want us to see what was in it. At the time, Scott had no idea that the body of Jonathan Francia was in the trunk. Scott, you got a gas can. No, but I can go borrow one. Okay. So I went next door, got the gas can, came back, and that's when Trina, Paul, and Jason we're outside talking. An hour later, Trina and Paul said they were leaving to escort Jason to the main highway. That was the last time I saw Jason. I thought that he went back to wherever he was, you know, maybe to Dallas or maybe somewhere else where he is, you know, where he told me he was from. 
Four days later, local police followed an eyewitness report to a remote corner of the desert, some 30 miles from Scott's trailer. There they found the burned out automobile and the charred remains believed to be Jonathan Francia. He said he was from Dallas. Paul Richardson was arrested just over two weeks later. Under questioning by the FBI, Paul admitted that he and Jason had abducted and then murdered Jonathan Francia. Kid in a, a car behind a restaurant. We took it. Two days after his confession, Paul Richardson committed suicide by hanging himself in his jail cell. Finding the remaining killer is now up to Jeannie Boylan. Would you create a division between the brows? Would you have it connected? I'd have it kind of. Authorities are counting on Jeannie's unique interviewing skills and artistic talent to help them flush out the mysterious the drifter, you Jason. That down to the surface. I'll compress it a little bit. To mm -hmm. When I first hit the composite, um, it looked pretty much like the same person that I've seen um, in, the, in the trailer. Pretty, pretty close. Um, I was amazed at how well it you know, turned out. I never thought I could remember that much. That's him. OK. OK, is there anything else you'd add to it? I believe that Ms. Boylan has a magician's touch in dealing uh, with witnesses who, and has a way of um, just extracting uh, a photo from their uh, mind, if you will. These are Jeannie's sketches of Jason, based on Scott Johnston's description. When I first saw the composite drawing, I felt a lot of anger because all this time there's not really been a picture. And now there's a face. And there's a real person out there who killed my son and who might kill somebody else's. It would set our hearts a little. It would give us a little ease in our heart. But to the fact that can't bring our son back, but it'll put him where he belongs. And that's what we need. That's what we need. I think, you know, if there's some way that this contribution can help bring some peace to them, then then I would I would be delighted. It, you know, you just want to do whatever you can do, and this is all I can do. In all, Jeannie drew three portraits of the man known as Jason. Authorities believe he has relatives in Pine Top or Payson, Arizona, and Dallas, Texas. Jason is described as 5'10", mid-20s, medium build. He smokes, chews tobacco, and wears Western-style clothes, including a horsehair belt. The man calling himself Jason has also used other first names. He supposedly frequents Las Vegas and homeless shelters in Laughlin, Nevada. Jason should be regarded as extremely dangerous. On our next Unsolved Mysteries, in Chicago, a mysterious young woman has charmed eligible bachelors, bewitched cab drivers, and haunted taverns and dance halls for decades. But there is something very different about this pale, alluring beauty. Can you guess what it is? Also one of our most poignant updates. Years ago, two strangers rescued a young mother from a fiery car crash. Your calls led to their heartwarming reunion. Join me next time for another hour of fascinating and intriguing mysteries. Thank you.